Let's review the structure of Job just to, uh, again, get a sense of where we are and what we're doing. The book begins with Job's affliction, the story of his affliction, chapters 1 and 2 that we have worked through. Job's first response, which is chapter 3. We then have the three cycles of debate between Job, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And uh, what we're doing right now is we are looking at the material in the three cycles of debate. Because there really is, in the three cycles of debate, there is a progression, or a twofold progression. There is the, the progression of the three friends who, as we have seen, become increasingly hostile and bitter and antagonistic towards Job. And there is the progression of Job himself, which is what we're going to look at today. You then have the wisdom poem that we have talked about somewhat. You then have the three great speeches, great in the sense uh, that there are very long speeches. Job's three chapters in 29 to 31, then Eliphaz in 32 to uh, 37, and then God in 38 to 41. Uh, and again, the three great speeches correspond to the three cycles of debate. And you do move towards, it's not in any way contradictory to the three cycles of debate, but again, in the three cycles of debate, you have this sort of theological progression Whereas in the three great speeches, you really move much more directly towards kind of the uh, heavenly solution to the problem of the book, of course, which is God's speech. You then have Job's second response, which we're going to unpack later. And then, of course, Job's final restoration of prosperity. So again, we are focusing right here at this time uh, in the three cycles of debate, looking to see what kind of progression has taken place. So having looked at the progression in all the speeches of the three, we will now begin to look at the speeches of Job. Of course, Job gave his opening uh, statement in chapter 3 with uh, his response to his situation and the cursing of his, the day of his birth. Eliphaz then began to dispute with him in chapters 4 and 5. And now we have Job's first response in chapters 6 and 7. Job's first response in chapters 6 and 7. So we begin. Let's take a look at, uh, warm ourselves up by looking a little bit of the text. Chapter 6, verse 1, Then Job answered and said, Oh, that my vexation were weighed, and all my calamities laid in the balances, for then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash. So he acknowledges he is speaking out of his pain. Verse 4, For the arrows of the Almighty are in me, my spirit drinks in their poison, the terrors of God are arrayed against me. We'll remember this verse uh, is reflected later in the uh, speech of Zophar in chapter 20. You remember, Zophar will pick up the idea and say, well, God shoots his arrows into the wicked. And he also will say, as we notice, Zophar uses the metaphor that the, um, the wicked are gluttons. They take in everything they can. They swallow down everything they can, but it turns to poison within them. So Job begins by speaking of his pain in terms of arrows and poison. And later, Zophar will say, well, that just proves you're wicked. Verse 5, does the wild donkey bray when he has grass or the ox low over his fodder? Now, we mentioned that Job uh, makes use of various a whole range of literary genres and patterns and types that we see elsewhere in the Old Testament. What is this pattern? Verse 5, what is that? It's a proverb. This is a proverb. It's a simple, straightforward, two-line proverb. Does the wild donkey bray when he has grass or the ox low over his fodder? So it's a metaphorical proverb drawn from agricultural life 
or from uh, observing animals in the wilderness, the wild donkey out in the wilderness, or the ox, which of course would be domesticated. Uh, what is the point of this proverb? What's it mean? Exactly. If you're satisfied, you don't complain. So when a donkey has got good pasture, he doesn't bray and complain. When the ox has got a full trough of food, he doesn't uh, make a fuss and complain. So Job is saying, yes, I have spoken very angrily, but I'm pretty provoked. So he's just using this proverb to kind of express his situation and kind of explain what he's doing. Um, and I just want to, uh, we'll look to, at a number of these, we've looked at several so far, these metaphors and these patterns of speech. What I am trying to get across is this. When we read straight through Job, we find, we find it to be at, at times almost hopelessly obscure. We think, why is he using this kind of language? Why is he talking this way? What's he talking about? He, he, you know, talking about something that is so far afield from the main issue. You know, here, a donkey, a wild donkey, and an ox. Well, what I'm trying to get across is he is using all kinds of poetic methods genres and so forth he is expressing himself as it were in a very high literary way but it's always on point it's never just you know meaningless poetic verbiage it is always there for a specific reason and it speaks directly to an issue so here what seems to be just um you know, again, this highly poetic literature, he is referring to the fact that, yes, he has spoken in great bitterness in chapter 3 when he cursed the day of his birth, but in fact, he is saying he had good reason to. Next, he uses, uh, in effect, another proverb. Can that which is tasteless be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the juice of the mallow? Verse 7, he comments on the little proverb, My appetite refuses to touch them. They are as food that is loathsome to me. Now here at this point, again, this is where he really seems to jump into something obscure. He talks about eating tasteless food, Apparently, the juice of the mallow is really not very tasty. I don't know what it is, but it's apparently not much to eat. But anybody can relate to the first line of verse 6. Can you eat insipid food without salt? And of course, the obvious answer is no. But once again, it seems like he's using all of this rhetorical devices. But to what purpose? Well... So he's had a metaphor of eating tasteless food and basically says in verse 7, I am not going to do that. It's disgusting to me. Why do you think he means by this? Why does he put this proverb in here? What's it mean? He's not going to go with what his friends are saying. Okay. The friends have given arguments that to him are like tasteless food. They are insipid. <laughs> They have no flavor. He can't savor them and think, wow, you know, that's right. That really helps me. There's something that they come into him and he just goes, yuck, that is nothing. And notice the metaphor really is not a food that is um, like extremely foul, you know, like rotten food. It's of something that is tasteless. What would tasteless imply with regard to an argument? It would be an argument that just carries no force. You just, you hear it and you say, well, yeah, so what? I mean, it doesn't mean anything. So his friends are saying things that to him 
carries no force with regard to his situation. So he says in verse 8, Oh, that I might have my request and God would fulfill my hope and that it would please God to crush me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. That would be my comfort. I would even exult in pain unsparing. For I have not denied the words of the Holy One. What is my strength that I should wait? What is my end that I should be patient? Is my strength the strength of stones? Or is my flesh bronze? Have I any help in me when resources when resource is driven from me? Well, what's he say there? I think it's pretty straightforward. He says, why is God just beating me to death and just letting me hang here? If he wants me to die, let him strike me dead. That would at least be the end of it. And so he says, am I like stone or bronze that you can just beat on and beat on and beat on and it doesn't hurt? He says, I'm not like that. It does hurt. And I can't take it. And so he moves on. We're going to very quickly look at a few of these verses and then come to what I think is a very critical verse. Uh, verse 14, he who is, withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers are treacherous as a torrent bed, as torrential streams that pass away, which are dark with ice. And where the snow hides itself, when they melt, they disappear. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. All right, now here he's again using this very metaphorical language, but he's talking about the friends. And in verses 15 to 17, what is the metaphor? Okay, a torrent bed, you know, if you've been to Israel, the wadi. And what is the, case, what is the situation of a wadi? Anybody know? Can, it's seasonal. It'll, it can have a, it's, well, I guess you got a lot of them around here. When it rains, they can be flash floods, but then very quickly they dry up and they have no water. And so uh, that's what he says his friends are like. He would go to them for a drink because he is metaphorically parched with thirst, you know, looking for comfort. But instead... They're all dried up. And he continues the metaphor in verses 18 to 20 with a, a little um, switch. The caravans turn aside from their course. They go up into the waste and perish. The caravans of Tima look. The travelers of Sheba look. They were confident. I'm going to say they're ashamed because they were confident. They have come there and are disappointed. So here he speaks of caravans that come to watering holes. And they find nothing. Metaphorically, that's Job coming to his friends and finding nothing. So look at verse 21. That's really a key verse here. For you have now become nothing. You see my calamity and are afraid. Notice that. Their response is that they are afraid. What are they afraid of? They're afraid that Job's condition represents the undoing of their whole theological system. Again, their basic system is the doctrine of retribution. They are seeing Job in torment, and they know he has been a righteous man. And so it is a violent contradiction to their theology, and they are afraid. And so he continues speaking to his friends, verses 21 and following. Um, have I said, make a gift or from your wealth, offer a bride to me or deliver me from the adversary's hand, redeem me from the life of the ruthless? He says, I haven't asked for anything of you materially, anything that would cost you anything. Going on, verse 24, teach me, I'll be silent. Make me understand how I've gone astray, how forceful or upright words but what does reproof from you reprove? Do you think you can reprove words when the speech of a despairing man is wind? You could even cast lots over the fatherless and bargain over your friend. But now be pleased to look at me, for I will not lie to your face. Please turn. Let no injustice be done. Turn now. My vindication is at stake. 
Is there any injustice in my turn? Turn the tongue. Cannot my palate discern the cause of calamity? Now, oh, this is a rather difficult speech, part of the speech. But basically, what he's saying, I think, is pretty clear. He wants them to teach him. He says, look, you've come to me. I don't want you to give me any money. I don't want you to try to physically rescue me from my situation. All I want you to do is, if you can do it, explain to me what has happened. Um, when he says, verse 27, you would even cast lots over the fatherless and bargain over your friend. I mean, that's a very severe charge, right? I mean, he's accusing them, it sounds like, of being the most ruthless kind of people. But I think it needs to be understood contextually, again, as another metaphor. He's basically saying, you would abandon me. You would give up on me. You would betray me, hand me over, rather than honestly face the situation. Rather than honestly face the dilemma that I represent, you would sell me out. Now, in what sense are they selling him out? They're selling him out by, um, by lies. I mean, ultimately what they will do is they will accuse him of being terribly wicked just to maintain the doctrine of retribution, even though it's not true. And so he asks again in verse 30, can you prove that what I have said is false? If you can, great. If not, you know, forget about it. We then come to chapter 7, where he begins to speak now. Uh, all, everything in chapter 6, basically, is an argument confronting his friends. You know, he is, he is dealing with his friends, and he's saying, uh, first of all, I spoke rashly because, my goodness, look what has happened to me. Secondly, you come to me with these insipid, tasteless arguments. Now, if you have something meaningful to say, say it, but don't accuse me and blame me for just speaking the truth. Now in chapter 7, uh, he starts to deal with the issue more directly. So 7 verse 1, Has not man a hard service on earth, and are not his days like the days of a hired hand, like a slave who longs for the shadow, like a hired hand who looks for his wages, so I am allotted months of emptiness and nights of misery are pointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? But the night is long. I am full of tossing until the dawn. My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens and breaks out afresh. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. Now, notice again, first of all, he is using uh, a number of metaphors. At the end of the passage, he uses the metaphor of the weaver's shuttle. Of course, when a weaver is weaving cloth and bringing the thread down on a loom, she'll go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, pressing down each successive uh, you know, row. And so it's something very fast. And he says, that's what my days are like. But notice especially what he does here. And this is very significant for the development of Job. He starts by talking about the suffering of humanity generally, but he weaves into that his personal suffering. Verses 1 and 2, he speaks of how human beings have a life of pain and hardship and work and suffering. Verse 3, he speaks of his own uh, months of emptiness and pain and how difficult his life is is uh, sleepless nights in verse 4. Verse 5, of course, he speaks of the pain in his flesh. Of course, he has this skin disease. His flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. It hardens and then breaks out afresh. So he sees himself physically a wreck. He is experiencing constant pain, no rest, but he weaves that into his portrait of humanity suffering generally. Why is that important? Well, it has to do with something I think that will become very prominent in Job's personal pilgrimage. That is how his personal suffering 
awakens him in a new way to the suffering of humanity. Now, Job had never been a, an unrighteous man in the sense that he didn't care about the suffering of people. We will see later on in um, chapter 31 where Job will describe at length how he, we would just basically say, how he was compassionate, how he gave to the poor, how he um, was not stingy, how generous he was with those who were suffering and those who were in need. So he's always been generous. It's not as if he was totally unaware of the suffering of the poor. But Job, before this time, had gone through life in an almost godlike fashion. By godlike, I don't mean, you know, he was, had heavenly powers, but I mean he was exempted, at least as far as we see in the narrative, exempted from suffering. Again, everything he did prospered. Anything he invested in did well. Um, he was healthy. He had a huge family. They were happy and partying every, you know, all the time. Uh, he had these huge flocks and herds. So where other people were suffering disease and miscarriage and poverty, he was just above it all in a real sense. So again, it's not that he was not compassionate. He was compassionate. <laughs> It's one thing to be compassionate, it's another thing to actually be in the situation, to experience it personally. And that moves us towards, you know, what is going to be a major theme of Job's spiritual development is the idea of redemptive suffering. That there, there is a kind of redemptive work you can do a kind of identifying with humanity that is only achieved in suffering. And Job is now experiencing that and he expresses it by melding together the general lot of humanity with his pain in particular. So we move on. Verse 7 Remember, my life is but a breath. My eye will never see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. Of course, this is what Zophar again had pointed to. Said, the wicked are people whom you see for a moment, then they're gone. Therefore, Job, you're wicked. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He returns no more to his house nor does his place know him anymore. Now, he is here talking about mortality, human mortality. And you've read some articles of different people give different opinions on mortality and Job and so forth. Or you will read them. First of all, he is speaking in terms of things that are undeniable. Verse 7, my life is but a breath. Well, that's true of all of us. We are all weak, we are all of the flesh, we are all going to die. And so the time will come that people who see us will see us no more. And verse 9, like clouds, again, a metaphor. Clouds, the sun beats on them and they just evaporate and vanish. So we will evaporate and vanish. And once we're dead, we're dead. Verse 9b, he who goes down to Sheol or to the grave does not come up. Once you've died, you've died. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him anymore. Well, let's step aside for a minute just to talk a little bit about the book of Job and its stance regarding afterlife, death and afterlife. I am sure you have heard, and it's basically true, that in the Old Testament, there is not a great deal about afterlife. There's not a whole lot said about the resurrection of the dead. There are a few very prominent passages, but not a lot. There's a lot of discussion of Sheol, the grave. And it is the, the definition or the description of Sheol is not real precise. Sometimes it just means apparently just the grave. It's just you die and your body is buried and that's the end of that. 
Sometimes it is kind of just the realm of the dead, an undefined realm of the dead. Because uh, even in Job already, we've seen he'll speak of, uh, he spoke of in chapter 3, Shale, where you have the great and the small, the rich and the poor, the master and the slave. They're all just down in shale. And so shale is just kind of this undifferentiated realm of the dead. And it's, again, very murky, very shady. And there's not a whole lot of precision or, or revelation about what goes on with the dead. Now, you do have a few places where you have a concept of resurrection. Job, the man operates, first of all, with this kind of baseline knowledge or baseline kind of outlook that the dead die and they're just dead and that's it. They maybe go to some place called Sheol. They, um, you know, what happens to them is kind of murky and is kind of unclear. That's kind of a, a again, that's not necessarily the doctrine of the Old Testament, but it's kind of a baseline uh, common viewpoint and so you have this reflected as well in many of the psalms where the psalmist will cry out you know save my life life O lord who can praise you from shale once i'm in the realm of the dead but job again in his spiritual progression i will argue will come much more to realize the necessity of a resurrection. That is, a, a rising from the dead and of seeing God after death. And so, this is, I mean, this is a very important aspect of Job's spiritual progression. I guess we really should make notes of the areas of his progression that we're going to be tracking here. Area one that Job's spiritual progression will uh, he'll work will work through is redemptive suffering. Area two is afterlife, as he will move from this murky non murky kind of uh, understanding of the grave as just the end or shale as an undefined realm of the dead to a much more precise doctrine of afterlife. There's at least one other area of progression of, of uh, Job's thought that we'll get to in a few moments. So verse 11, Therefore I will not restrain my mouth, I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. So let's again notice this, the course of his argument in chapter 7. In chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, he speaks of human mortality and suffering and hardship, and he blends his own suffering in with that of the lot of humanity and in a new way, I think, sympathizes and and identifies with the suffering of human beings. In chapters, I'm sorry, verses 6 to 10, or verses 7 to 10, he speaks of his, the brevity of his life, and once he's dead, he's dead and gone. But again, this is the starting place. His sense of being just another suffering human, and his sense of... Um, being mortal and doomed to die and vanish. And it is from this point he will move forward. But in verse 11, he says, I, that's why I don't restrain my mouth. I mean, this being my condition and the human condition, obviously I've got some things to say. So verse 12. Am I the sea or a sea monster that you set a guard over me when I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint? Then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions so that I would choose strangling and death rather than my bones. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. 
Leave me alone, for my days are a breath. What is man that you make so much of him and you set your heart on him? Visit him every morning and test him every moment. How long will you not look away from me and leave me alone till I swallow my spit? If I sin, what do I do to you, O oh, watcher of mankind? What have you made me? Why have you made me your mark? Why have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I shall lie in the earth. You will seek me, but I shall not be. Well, what kind of text is this? This is a prayer. One thing that is noteworthy about Job's speeches as in contrast to the three is the three never pray. They never speak to God. Job prays constantly. Virtually every speech he makes, he at some point will turn away from the three and start talking to God. His prayers, especially this one, can be very blunt, very direct. But again, that's not unusual in the Old Testament. The prayers of the sufferer in the book of Psalms are also at times extremely blunt. Use language that most of us probably don't usually use. But how does he speak to God? He says, am I some kind of a monster that you have to punish me so hard to keep me in check? This is verse 12. Again, every time you see this metaphorical language, ask yourself, what is he trying to communicate? Well, the monster, the sea monster, would be what? Like Leviathan. It would be the most powerful, dangerous, evil creature of all. Obviously a creature that God needs to keep his eye on, to keep in check. And Job is saying, when you beat me and you punish me and you make me suffer so much, is it because I'm so terrible and horrible and monstrous that if you don't do this, I'm going to uh, create havoc? So he's saying, basically, I don't see why you're doing this to me. He again complains about how he suffers on his bed in verse 13 and speaks of how God terrifies him with dreams and visions in verse 13. 14. So he sees God as kind of almost tormenting his mind with the pains he has given him. And again in verse 15 says he'd rather just die than continue to go on in this way. When he says in verse 16, I loathe my life, I would not live forever. He's not speaking of a doctrine of afterlife there. He's speaking of continuing on in his present situation. In other words, I don't want to keep living day after day after day after day like this. And so he asked God to basically leave him alone rather than torment him so much. Verse 17 is where you have what appears to be a deliberate kind of inversion, almost a parody of Psalm 8. What is man that you make so much of him and set your heart on him? And he looks at God as God very carefully watching people to see where they do anything wrong or anything that he might punish them for and immediately afflicting them with wrath. Now again, go back to the beginning of his speech. He's in great pain and therefore his words are rash. But his words are still serious in the sense that Job comes to this once again from the standpoint of the doctrine of retribution. He is not different from the four. I mean, from the three at the beginning of the book. He is one of them. He is not different. He believes basically in the doctrine of retribution. When he is being punished, his frame of reference tells him, God is treating you as wicked. That's the only way he knows to explain his pain and his suffering. And so he looks now upon God as just watching him so closely that God is just going to torment him, if nothing else, to prevent him from doing anything wicked. So that's what he means when he says, what is man that you keep such a close eye on him? So again, these are words of harsh 
that, that arise from deep pain, and the words are fairly harsh, but it is a serious question. Behind it all, although Job himself doesn't really understand it at this point, behind it all is the inadequacy of the doctrine of retribution. Job is speaking this way because he holds to that doctrine as being the whole explanation for suffering. Later he will learn there's more to it than that. All right. Bildad speaks in chapter 8 and gives his basic aphorisms affirming essentially the doctrine of retribution. And in chapter 9, Job gives his first response to Bildad, chapter 9 and chapter 10. He says, chapter 9, verse 2, Truly I know that it is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and succeeded? He who removes mountains, and they know it not, when he overturns them in his anger, and who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sea and it does not rise, who seals up the stars, who alone stretched out the heavens and who trampled the waves of the sea, who made the bear and Orion, Pleiades and the chambers of the south, who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number. Behold, he passes by me. I see him not. He moves on. I do not perceive him. Behold, he snatches away. But who can turn him back? Who will say to him, what are you doing? Job is doing two things here. First of all, he is giving a standard orthodox and valid, correct, um, statement about the glory and majesty of God. He uses language that you see repeatedly in the Old Testament. For example, verse 8, he stretched out the heavens and he trampled the waves of the sea, meaning he put the sea in its place. Verse 9, he created the constellations, the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, so the constellations in the heavens. Verse 7, alluding to creation, he commands the sun and the stars, he sets them in motion, he uh, governs the seasons of the earth. So this is all standard language for the majesty and greatness of God. So Job knows this and he accepts it. The friends will use similar language and similar arguments. But the way Job uses it is distinctive. I guess we've talked a little about this, but let's make sure we understand what Job is doing and what he wants. In the speeches of Job, what does he desire? What, is it, what does he really, really want that he keeps coming back to? Anybody know? What is the main thing he wants? Go ahead. He wants God to speak up and say something. He wants God to say something. That's true. There's it, a little more to it than that, but that's true. Go ahead. He wants an explanation. That's true. He wants to go to court with God. He wants to go to court with God. He wants to get into a one on one debate with God, a court case. You know, in, in Hebrew, a reeve, in which he can present his case, God can present his case, and somehow it get adjudicated. Because he is confident that he would win if he could get a fair hearing. Why is he confident he would win? Because he knows he has been righteous. Has he been righteous? Yes. Now, that's why it is so important to get the premise of the book. 
If you don't get the premise, then Job's desire, you just say, well, you're totally wrong. You would lose because you're wicked. You're a sinner. You have to accept the premise of the book for the argument of the book to work. He is righteous and he desires this case that he could stand up before God and make his argument because he's sure he would win. The problem is not that Job is really harboring secret sins or something that he's being punished for because he's not being punished. Again, the prologue makes it clear he is suffering for his righteousness. The problem, again, is Job is operating purely from the doctrine of retribution. He thinks that's the only explanation. And if he could stand before God, he would be vindicated. So when you read all of his speeches, that is what his desire is. And now notice he doesn't even just say, oh God, take the pain away, make me well again, or uh, you know, restore my wealth or something like that. He wants the chance to prove himself and vindicate himself before God. And Job's error is thinking that the doctrine of retribution is the only doctrine that has come into play here. And so again, I keep reminding you of certain things. Remember, when God does confront Job, he does not accuse Job of any sin. Because that's really not the issue. Okay? Yes? I'm just a little uh, confused because it seems like Job and the three friends admit that man is sinful and can't be right before God. Mm -hmm. So how does that match up with Job believing in the doctrine of retribution and being innocent? Well, when it says, verse 2, how can a man be in the right before God, I don't think it means, you know... Uh, within his context, within his context, I don't think it means um, we're all sinners, therefore I'm a sinner. What it means is how can a man win a case before God? And when he talks about, that's a good question, when he talks about the majesty of God, what he's saying is God is so high and so lofty and so powerful, how could I ever get a fair hearing with him? You know, it's, think of it from the standpoint of the ancient Near Eastern court. Ancient Near Eastern court, like in Israel, at the gate of the city, where two men have a disagreement over property or something like that, and they go to the gate of the city and they argue their case. Well, hypothetically, it was all fair and even, but of course the reality was never quite that way. If you have one man come to the gate, and he is very powerful and very influential, and he's a friend of the king, and he owns all the property and around the, the town and everything else. And another man come who is a poor beggar to argue his case against him. The reality is the beggar is going to have a really hard time winning that case. Well, with God, it's the same idea, only multiplied, you know, a hundredfold. God is so high, so powerful, um, so great. So awesome. The, Job says, I just can't possibly stand before him and make my case. And in fact, he won't show up. He's invisible. I look for him and he, he never shows his face. So again, it is not... Um, you know, you really need to, to try to get your head into empathizing with Job. When Job speaks of the majesty of God, he believes it. You know, he's not an unbeliever, a doubter, or something like that. He believes God is great. But he is also in this horrible suffering. And in the midst of his suffering, and, and again, he's a righteous man, he wants to be able to speak to God. And he just knows it's, it's just not going to happen. Go ahead. Is that the second thing they said? Two things that Job is trying to do here is one is to give a standard orthodox and God's statement. Yeah, and the other, the two, the other two things he's doing in this passage is voicing his desire to have this kind of lawsuit adjudicated with God. 
And the, the relationship between the two, I need to make that clear. The relationship is because God is so great, so awesome, so powerful, an equal, fair, open uh, court case between the two of them is just not going to happen. So that's what he's saying. Go ahead. Um, does Job want somebody to be an intermediary between himself and God? Well, that's what he's moving toward. Yes, he will want, and, and that's coming up right away. He does want an intermediary between himself and God. Okay? Yes? Um, and just thinking through, does Job, it seems like Job uh, admits sin, not, not that he has sinned, therefore he's being punished for it, but admits the fact that he's not sinless um, when he says in verse 26 of 13, uh, and you make me to inherit the iniquities of my youth. So, so is yeah. that how we should understand Job? Is that like he he is man, he is sinful, but he has not um, sinned against the Lord. You know. He, yeah, Job will speak in these terms of inheriting the sin of his youth and so forth, and his common identity of human and humans as all being you know wicked and so forth. But it is again. Um, The important thing to grasp is for the purposes of the suffering of Job. Any sin he may have committed in his youth or whatever is irrelevant. That is just not part of the picture. He, his suffering has absolutely nothing to do with sin. So that's the main thing. To, because of his sin, like you said, because of his righteousness that he is, that he is suffering. Um, so how are we going to understand like what w when the word righteous is used about Job? I always think of it. It's hard not think of it, the New Testament idea of righteousness, which is perfection. Um, but so, so is it is it operating in, in, in a different understanding of righteousness in the Old Testament? I I really don't know that I would say it was a different understanding of righteousness. I guess it could be. Um, the ideal of righteousness in the Old Testament is, first of all, to restrain from various kinds, to, to, to restrain yourself from evil, you know, which would be the obvious things, lying, stealing, adultery, murder, so forth. But also to show compassion. And so Job in his life did both of those, and plus he feared God. He knew God, he feared God. So those three things, I guess, are, are the essence of Old Testament righteousness. You fear God, you turn away from doing evil, and you actively show compassion. And that was what Job was. So I don't know if you want to speak of perfection or not, but you know that's, that's the essence of righteousness in the Old Testament, and that's what God says Job was. Go ahead. Um, obviously, like you've been saying, he's thinking of the suffering is because of, uh, that suffering comes because of sin that it automatically indicates God's displeasure. Uh, it's maybe just also the idea, obviously the flip side is that his blessing and his prosperity before he attributed that to his blamelessness and his righteousness? Um, in a sense, yes. I mean, you know, it is a basic general truth of wisdom that if you do what is right, and if you fear God, you will do well, and God will watch over you. Um, I mean, you see this everywhere in Proverbs, you know, that if you, if you live a life of integrity, and if you are diligent, if you're honest, if you restrain yourself from evil, and if you fear God, in every sense, your life will go well as a general rule. You know, you will, uh, your life will not be cut short by violence or whatever. Uh, you will not fall into poverty. And generally, you'll experience the blessing of God. And that is true. And, and it's, again, very important to understand, Job is not denying that wisdom is true. But, but this basic core of wisdom is not the whole story. There's more to it than that. So does that answer your question? Yeah. 
I guess I kind of think of maybe is that what causes his confusion too? Is he was blessed greatly, nothing changed, and all of a sudden he's suffering greatly. Right. And yeah, I mean, his basic confusion is you know he was living according to wisdom and he was reaping the benefits of it. So as far as he could tell, well, yeah, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and my life is good. Suddenly, his life is horrible, but he hadn't changed. So, you know, that's, that is the basis of his confusion. Okay? Professor? Yes. Good question. Regarding, regarding the, the offering of Job, when, when he offered sacrifices for, you know, for, for his children, mm -hmm. is that kind of related or connected to the Mosaic law of offering, you know, like, when they, when they offer sacrifices, mm -hmm. is that some kind of, is that related or? Well, clearly it is a method of appealing to God to be forgiving if his children have sinned. I don't, you know, I, I, I mean, the whole biblical concept of forgiveness is something that is, that the book of Job at that level doesn't get into. Uh, for the concept of forgiveness, you get much more in like Psalm 51, where forgiveness comes by the mercy of God. You appeal to God, you confess your sin, you look for God to be merciful as he is defined as merciful in Exodus 32, 6. And you don't depend on animal sacrifice, as David says, Psalm 51. You do not desire the blood of bulls and goats, or I would give it. Um, in my view, the substitutionary atonement of uh, here we're getting at, you know into like Leviticus. The substitutionary aspect of that is symbolic. It doesn't even at any point in the Old Testament, animal sacrifices do not purchase forgiveness. Uh, but it is symbolic and it removes ritual impurity. But true forgiveness, you know, again, back to Psalm 51, what God desires is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So, so no, I don't think Job is implying that the, the animal sacrifices are like a purchase of forgiveness but they are, if you will, more a request for forgiveness. That's how I would interpret it. Okay. So where were we? We're at, Bil at, at the response to Bildad's speech. We're in chapter 9. And we went through Job's uh, initial uh, response. And we come to verse 13, uh, which really kind of repeats the same idea, but we'll very quickly look at it. God will not turn back his anger. Beneath him bowed the helpers of Rahab. Uh, this is, of course, a myth, a kind of a dragon figure that God subdued. So if God could subdue Rahab, he can subdue anybody. How then can I answer him choosing my words with him? Notice what he's saying here. I just, I don't have standing to answer God. I can't possibly stand before him and make my case. Verse 15, though I am in the right, I cannot answer him. I must appeal for mercy to my accuser. Now notice what he says again, and this is very, very important. It's really, really critical, I think, that the reader hold fast to the premise of the book. When he says, though I am in the right, he's not incorrect. He is in the right, but it's the wrong case. He, again, he thinks it's all a matter of the doctrine of retribution, but it is not. He was, again, just to put it simplest terms, you know, you don't even need to read through the rest of the book to get the point here. Just think back to the prologue. His suffering was never a punishment for sin. Okay? But he, he is behaving as though it were. Job is thinking as though it were a punishment for sin. Go ahead. Is this the same Rahab which is in the book of Joshua? A Joshua. I don't recall where Rahab... Oh, 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 no, no, no. Uh, no, not Rahab the prostitute. You have actually three different Rahabs in the Bible. You have Rahab the prostitute. You have Rahab sometimes used as a term for Egypt. And you have Rahab who is kind of a... Uh, 
kind of a mythical dragon figure like Leviathan. That's what this Rahab is. Verse, uh, what, 16, if I, am summon, if I summoned him and he answered me, notice this is summoning to a court. I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. In other words, like he's so powerful, you talk to him, he doesn't even need to pay attention. He crushes me with a tempest. He multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not let, uh, not let me get my breath, but fills me with bitterness. So again, it's all in this kind of image of the court case where he sees himself as just totally cowed by the power of God. He can't speak even though he's in the right. If it is a contest of strength, behold, he is mighty. If it is a matter of justice, who can summon him? Though I am in the right, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I am blameless, he would prove me perverse. In other words, again, he would be so cowed by God in court that he would just say, well, yeah, you're right. You know, I must have done something wrong. <laughs> Verse 21, I am blameless. I regard not myself. I loathe my life. It is all one. Therefore, I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. That is. Again, there's a few verses that you really get to the heart of the matter. This is one of those verses. Job holds to the doctrine of retribution, but as far as he can see now, God just destroys people indiscriminately, whether you are righteous or wicked. And so, again, this is at the very heart of Job's complaint. Verse 20. Verse 20. Um, Verse 22, he destroys the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its justice. If it is not he, who then is it? Well, you know, as we go through all this, I want to take time out just for us to catch our breath and relax and kind of come up for air and Think about it in contemporary terms. Think about disasters. You have, you have natural disasters and you have disasters that are the result, you know, of human evil. Uh, you may remember a number of years ago there was a bombing at what was it called? The Morrow Building, a federal building in... Oklahoma City, thank you. And so, you know, these guys went there and they put in the bomb and they blew up the building and killed a lot of people. And then, of course, we had 9-11, which was, you know, a thousand times worse, where human evil, human wickedness comes and they, they cause all this disaster. So you look at it as a Christian, and, and I'll, I'll relate this in a moment, but I vividly remember what mini one minister said on the scene in Oklahoma City as he tried to make sense of it all. First question, is God over all this stuff or not? Yes. You have to say, if you believe in an almighty God, that God is over all of this. Could God have stopped the Oklahoma City bombing? <coughs> Yes. Could he have stopped the airplanes from hitting the towers on 9-11? Yes. God could have done it. God could have stopped Katrina. God could have stopped the tsunami in the Indian Ocean that killed, what was it, a quarter million people? So you have to begin with the premise, God could stop it all. God is in control of everything. And that's what Job is saying. When he says, if it is not he, who then is it? Who's in charge? So, the obvious question is, um, why did God let this happen? Now, let me relate to you what this one minister on the scene said at Oklahoma City. Um, his answer was very simply, God had nothing to do with this. This was just human evil. These people were bad and they did a terrible thing. So don't talk about blaming God because God had nothing to do with it. Well, in a sense, you can see the validity of saying this was just their sin. They're responsible for what they did. 
But in, a, in the ultimate sense, as we just said, you have to say, God still rules everything. God can permit and God can thwart. So you can't, you know, God in the Bible, God never passes the buck. You remember what it says in the book of Amos, shall there be evil, which means trouble, disaster in a city, and the Lord has not done it. The answer is the Lord has done it. it may have been wicked men involved, but the Lord did it. You remember when Moses at the burning bush, Exodus 3 and 4, and I think this is specifically chapter 4, when he is speaking to God and he says, uh, well, God, you just can't send me. I mean, I'm a horrible speaker. I'll sound like an idiot. Let someone else go. And what does God say? Who made man blind or seeing or speaking or deaf? Is it not I, the Lord? So where we would tend to say, okay, this child was born deaf or born blind because of some, maybe his mother got some disease when she was pregnant or, you know, we would look to all kinds of physical causes. There was a genetic problem, uh, in the, in the course of the, the baby's development. God just says, well, I'm the one who's in charge. I did it. So in the Bible, God never says it's not my fault. He takes responsibility for essentially everything that goes on in the world. So in that sense, again, you really have to hear Job and for that matter, the three sympathetically to understand the case he's making. God's in charge of all this stuff. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, tell, God just indiscriminately at one point uh, slaps down a wicked man, but at another point slaps down a righteous man. And so, you know, you might as well just face the fact that, that God is, is not is uh, behaving, I guess ultimately Job is saying, God is behaving in a manner that is not consistent with justice. And if I could confront him in a law court, I'd prove it. That's what Job is basically saying. Without working through the whole point of the book of Job, at this point, go back to what that minister said in the Oklahoma City bombing. You know, it wasn't God, it was just a wicked man. What do you say to that? How do you respond to that? Go ahead. I don't know. It seems, well, the wicked man is culpable. Uh, mm -hmm. But God is still sovereign. Okay, true. Seems as God in potency. Yes, it does. It makes basically God to be weak. I mean, what is... In the problem of evil... As it's classically posed, the problem of evil is God is supposed to be both righteous and good and caring and almighty. And yet we see all this evil in the world around us. And we see horrible deeds that thrive and succeed and wicked people who thrive and succeed. Therefore, God is either not almighty and sovereign or God is not good or God just is not. There's no God. I mean, that's the problem of evil in a nutshell. Let me just suggest this before we go any further. In regards to what that, that minister said, my answer would be this, as, as you have said, first of all, yes, there's no doubt that the man who perpetrated the deed was himself culpable. He's responsible for his own actions. He conceived it, he desired it, he carried it out. He's guilty. Um, on the other hand, God is almighty. God is in charge. Beyond that, I think, and, and this does get ahead to where we're going in Job, 
the main thing you have to say is, the main thing you have to be willing to confess and hold to in faith is, we don't know everything God is doing here. You know, we don't really understand why God allowed this to happen. We can be sure he had many reasons. Now, part of it could be related to the doctrine of retribution. Maybe it could be in part a warning to the, uh, to the, the nation of the United States, the American people, about their becoming a wicked people. And terrible things are starting to happen to them. Let's, I'm just, I'm kind of chasing this rabbit just to give us a break, but it's a very important rabbit. You know, again, when you think about, again, we'll confine it to America, Katrina slamming into the Gulf Coast and causing so much havoc and suffering. And you ask, you know, why does this happen? Why would God allow this to happen? Is punishment for sin a legitimate possible explanation for God's activity? It is a legitimate possible explanation. Where do we have, in this is kind of question you're sort of having to read my mind, but also, you know, I'll test your, your quick thinking through the Gospels. Where does Jesus refer to a similar type situation? Go ahead. Okay, the Tower of Siloam. Remember the tower that fell down and killed those people? Do you think it's because they were more wicked than anyone else? No, but I tell you, unless you repent, he will likewise perish. And remember those men whom Pilate mingled their blood with their sacrifices. Do you think it was because they were more wicked than anyone else? No, but I tell you, unless you repent, he will likewise perish. Implicit in Jesus' answer is they were in fact being punished. That God's wrath was being punished poured out on the people, uh, the Jews of the first century. But notice what he does. And notice the limits of what we can say. First of all, he says, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So what does that imply to us? That implies we can never attribute the punishment to the sin of other people and assume they are worse than us. We should always take it as a warning, knowing we are no better than them. And what would be an example of doing it the wrong way? I can think of an example from when Katrina hit. I heard Christians saying, well... God punished that region because along the Gulf Coast there were a lot of casinos. And so God just specifically hit that region because of the casinos. Well, what are you doing? You're singling out a sin that you don't commit. I assume these church members who said that, you know, they didn't regularly go to casinos. You single out a sin you don't commit, you attribute it to those people, and you say they all suffered because of that sin. And that is not what Jesus says we can do. We don't know why specifically that region suffered the way it did. And we certainly don't know of any specific sin they committed that made them worse than us. Rather, we should take it simply uh, as a warning that yes, God punishes a sinful people and I am no worse I'm no better than they are and unless I repent I will likewise perish so yes there is retribution for sin again the, the doctrine of retribution is true it's just not the whole story but then again there is another thing you can say about these disasters and suffering God has all kinds of purposes we just don't know about. Sometimes they may involve terrible suffering, but we already know from Scripture not all suffering is, in fact, punishment for sin. 
So it's complicated. Only God knows the purpose behind everything he's doing. Our function in the face of all that is again, Job 28, this is wisdom, fear God, and turn from evil. Can we acknowledge that there is punishment for sin in these disasters? Yes, we can. But again, we should do so out of fear. You know, if, uh, if a really, really um, massive earthquake strikes Southern California, no doubt there will be a lot of people who will say, well, you know, California, what do you think? I mean, naturally, those people are worse than everyone else, and that's why God punished them. But it's not true. To some extent, a great earthquake, you know, in, in God's plan, in God's mind, it, it may be punishment for sin. In fact, I think you could say very much it is. But it's not that these people are worse than anyone else. That they are worse than the rest of us who live in the middle of the country. Okay. By the way, this is just one last little footnote to my little chasing rabbits. When Jesus said that about the Tower of Siloam and the blood of the Jews making the sacrifice that, that uh, Pilate mingled their blood with their sacrifices, what was he getting at? What was that referring to? Any idea? What was it pointing toward? Destruction of Jerusalem. Destruction of Jerusalem. Falling of towers. People being slain by Roman swords. This is the destruction of Jerusalem. If you've ever gone to Jerusalem, you go to the Temple Mount, you know, right underneath uh, what is now the Al-Aqba Mosque, and you see an old Roman street, first century street, a street that Jesus would have no doubt walked on, and you can see where the, these, these massive uh, stones that were the, the pavement of the street are caved in and broken. Whereas the temple was burning, these huge rocks fell down from the Temple Mount, fell onto the street and broke it up. And this very, very vivid image of the fury of the fall of Jerusalem. So when Jesus said, unless you likewise repent, you will, unless you repent, you will likewise perish, he wasn't speaking metaphorically. Okay? Um... So where are we? He comes back in verse, well, where we are in practice is really needing a break. Let me finish chapter 9 and then we'll take a break and then resume with chapter 10. My days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. They go by like skiffs of reed, like an eagle swooping on the prey. I say, I will forget my complaint. I will put off my sad face and be of good cheer. I become afraid of all my suffering, and I know you will not hold me innocent. I shall be condemned. Why then do I labor in vain? If I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, you will plunge me into the pit, and my own clothes will abhor me. Notice what he says here. First of all, the, the first metaphor, he goes back to the brevity of his life. In verse 25, he uses the metaphor of a runner. His days run away. He uses the metaphor of uh, skiffs of reed, little boats made of reed that uh, would, would sit very high in the water and float very fast by. Uh, an eagle swooping on the prey. And of course, this is of itself just an image of speed. His days are very brief. But an eagle swooping on its prey connotes death and destruction striking from the sky. And so De uh, Job sees himself like this. And he says... If I just try to say, oh, well, I'll just put on a happy face and say, it's okay. Well, I can't do that. Notice verse 28. He says he's afraid because of his suffering. 
And the thing that makes him afraid is, again, that his doctrine of retribution has gotten all messed up. God is going to treat him as guilty no matter what. He says, even though I'm innocent, you'll condemn me. If I wash my hands with lie, you'll just throw me into a pit. It's like God will pick up a clean Job and throw him into the mire just to make him dirty so he can punish him more. So again, Job is speaking of great bitterness, but what he's saying is, as far as I can see, it does not make any difference whether a man is righteous or evil. You treat him all the same way. Uh, so we come to verse 32, very important. For he is not a man as I am, that I might answer him, that we should come, together, come to trial together. There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on both of us. Let him take his rod away from me. Let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak without fear of him, for I am not so in myself. Well, this is the third big issue in the spiritual pilgrimage of Job. It is the, the desire for an intermediary slash redeemer. What Job is coming to realize is that he needs someone to stand between himself and God. Again, God is so high, so lofty, uh, beyond question. Job is so small, so weak. He is realizing human beings of themselves cannot stand before God. There has to be someone to stand between a man and God to bring them together and to work things out and to bring about a resolution. So these are three major areas of Job's spiritual progression. Redemptive suffering, his awareness, uh, his his sympathy and empathy, his, his connection with the suffering of humanity through his own suffering. The doctrine of afterlife, moving from this murky notion of Sheol to a, a resurrection and a vision of God after death, and the necessity of an intermediary and a redeemer. 